everyone happy morning a very good morning i hope and i believe all of you are doing well uh, a quick note whether the audio visual is all good Okay, that's great. So, uh, everyone, welcome to the today's YouTube live session. And we have the next set of fast five clinical MCQs like we had yesterday, right? So, uh, the plan of the classes is uh, basically now um, uh, daily almost for the next four to five days. 11.30 uh, a.m. is we will be having the special class as well. Special class is basically the free live class on the Unacademy app. So we need to log in into the Unacademy app and if asked for a code, you can use the code Dr. Nikita. And we will be having KBMD episodes, uh, right? A series of all the KBMD episodes is what we will be having. It will be based on mnemonics, on concepts, on clinical scenarios and a lot of it, okay? So 11.30 a.m., uh, we are going to have uh, the KBMD sessions on the app from tomorrow, okay? And an update, I hope all of you know about the new QBank 2.0 that's coming up on the platform very soon. And we, based on that, we also have the QBank 2.0 challenge where we have 15 questions, 15 minutes is what you can take. And, um, you know, the top 50 learners get a chance to uh, get the free subscription, right? And apart from that, there's also a price hike alert that I would like each one of you to know about. That very soon, that's going to be a hike in the price. So if you're planning to take a subscription, the best time is now because we also have the Accelerate program where you can save up to 42% with free extension up to six months. And this is valid only till August 12th, right? This is only till 12th of August. That is tomorrow and day after. And you can see that basically the longer the subscription you take, the more free extension you get and the more discounts also is what you get so basically the longer subscription is what is gonna give you uh, like you know it's gonna be more cost effective so make sure you do it in time also we have the live doubt clarification sessions coming in and uh, you'll be having the radiology doubt clarification on 17th of august 10 pm every day is when you have the doubt clarification time with the respective subject educator there's the ongoing test and discussion batch, which is going on on the platform, useful for ideally everyone, okay? Uh, Anirudh is asking how to review the GT first. Uh, unable to review the whole GT before it's time for the next. So it's always best to whatever thing you want to complete, do it with time boxing uh, so that you have a definite time. Give yourself that target, right? One question, maximum five minutes is what you should be giving. Even maximum, I'm telling in five minutes. Uh, right so make sure uh, you time box and you do so that it will increase your speed uh, false deadlines giving yourself false deadlines actually works okay uh, Krishna Kant, yes you can definitely do that make a separate notebook for the KBMDs whatever points you are learning because all the sessions that we would be having will have some learning points with every question you would be learning something so as we are discussing you can just scribble down quickly like you do in any live offline class as well so that uh, you know it becomes uh, uh, handy later on for revision all right Bharti I'll take up in one of the upcoming sessions uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia okay I'll do that uh, any other queries before we proceed with today's fast five uh, questions? All right. So let's start with this one. This is the first question, really a lengthy one. So please read the question and let's see who gets it right the first.
what do you think is the answer? Okay, Rituraj says it's E, glycogen phosphorylase. Alright, so I see majority of you marking the answer as E. But let me tell you, E is not the correct answer. E is not the correct answer. Right, so this is a tricky sort of question but with a very, very important concept to be learned here. The answer is not E. Everybody is answering E. Um, so all of you must have read the question and the question is basically telling that uh, this is a history of fasting for approximately 24 hours. Nobody has eaten anything, right? And on the, uh, there is hepatomegaly, the patient is listless and then there is seizures also that are there. So um, then what is the most important clue here is lab results show that Acetoacetate is not detected. Okay, acetoacetate is not detected. This is an 8 year old boy. Even after 24 hours of fasting, acetoacetate is not detected. Acetoacetate is basically the ketone bodies, right? Basically, it is the ketone bodies. So, uh, ketone bodies in adults, what happens? Like in fasting, ketone bodies are used as the fuel source after like uh, 24 hours, 48 hours or so. But because in a child, the glucose, the glycogen reserves are relatively less, ketone bodies come into action sooner. Like 8 to 12 hours, may ketone bodies chahiye to compensate for the fasting. Now, what are we seeing here that in this child, even after 24 hours, the ketone bodies are not present. So, that means there is a problem with the ketone bodies formation, right? There is a problem with the ketone bodies formation, acetoacetate. From where this acetoacetate is getting formed? Basically, we require acetyl-CoA for the formation of ketone bodies. What gives the acetyl-CoA is basically the fatty acid oxidation, right? The beta oxidation of the fatty acids. Fatty acid oxidation produces your acetyl-CoA, which can then be utilized for the ketone bodies formation. So, that means there is a problem with the fatty acid oxidation. Acetyl-CoA is not there. So, ketone bodies are not there. So, uh, either it is acetyl-CoA carboxylase or it is acyl-CoA dehydrogenase because the rest of the options, acid alpha glucosidase, glucose 6-phosphatase, glycogen phosphorylase, the options B, D and E are basically the enzymes of glycogenolysis, right? If it was glycogenolysis ka problem, that basically leads to glycogen storage disorder okay that leads to glycogen storage disorder in glycogen storage disorder the ketone body production is not affected because the fatty acid oxidation is not affected in that case the ketone bodies would be produced here because the ketone bodies are not produced so it's fatty acid oxidation so these options are ruled out the enzyme acetyl coa carboxylase this is the rate limiting enzyme of Fatty acid synthesis, right? Acetyl CoA carboxylase. We are adding the carbon carbon atoms and making a long chain of fatty acid to the backbone of acetyl CoA. So, this is fatty acid synthesis. Ulta acyl CoA dehydrogenase, that is basically oxidation. Okay, this is fatty acid oxidation. So, the answer is basically C, that is acyl CoA dehydrogenase, because this is the problem with. Fatty acid oxidation. So, if you look at this pathway of fatty acid oxidation, right, let me try zooming in this image. So, fatty acid, there is acyl CoA, then you have this carnitine which comes into play, acyl carnitine, then you have this acyl CoA dehydrogenase, right, acyl CoA dehydrogenase. So, the uh, MCAD deficiency. Basically, this is MCAD, that is medium chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. The terminology used is it causes hypoketotic hypoglycemia. Ekto fasting mein glucose kam ho jayega, and the ketone bodies are also not getting formed. So, it is hypoketotic hypoglycemia that can lead to seizures and that can lead to sudden death. Okay, so this is a very, very important learning point here. Remember, this is a diagnosis of MCAD, that is medium chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. So, basically, this produces acetyl CoA, which can then produce ketone bodies or it can go into TCA cycle. So, what do we do in these patients? 
So until and unless the fatty acid oxidation is required, the patient will not have any symptoms. So it's like during the ketone body formation, that is fasting period, may there will be these symptoms that can lead to sudden death also. That is why in this patients, fasting is contraindicated. Fasting should not be there. And whenever there is an illness or anything, you know, immediate glucose should be given. Immediate glucose should be given, right? So what did we learn here? Basically, we have learned about the topic of MCAD deficiency. That is medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. What does that manifest with? Right, remember this point, MCAD deficiency basically has hypoketotic hypoglycemia. The ketone bodies will not be formed, right? Hypoketotic hypoglycemia. Clear with everyone? Right, so it was none of the glycogen wala enzyme. It was uh, basically fatty acid oxidation which was defective. So a quick thumbs up. I believe it was a good question. Everybody got trapped with the E option, glycogen wala. It's not glycogen wala. Okay. Going to the next question now, this should be relatively easy. The last two lines of this question give away the crux of the question. Absolutely right. So basically what is given here, there is this entire story which is given, which is actually not very important to read. The last two lines that HLA-B57 is positive. So which medications is contraindicated in this patients because of a potentially fatal hypersensitive reaction? It is Abakavir, right? It is Abakavir. We have discussed this in our KBMD session so many times that for Abakavir, it is HLA B57 testing that we need to do. If it is positive, it is contraindicated, it can lead to hypersensitivity reactions, it can also lead to MI. So remember HLA B, okay, when you write HLAB, right? So AB tells you that. It is Abakavir. Okay, it is basically Abakavir for which HLA testing is important. HLA B57. Okay, HLA B57. All right. Uh, to which group of drug does this Darunavir belong? In your HIV drugs, uh, Darunavir belongs to which group? NRTI, NNRTI. Is it your protease inhibitor, integrase inhibitor? What is Darunavir? So, all the navirs, okay, all the navirs are basically protease inhibitors, okay. Endinavir, Sacunavir, Ritonavir, Darunavir, Atazanavir, all the navirs, okay, the navirs are the protease inhibitors. While Abakavir, what is Abakavir? Is Abakavir a protease inhibitor? To which group does Abakavir belong? What does Abakavir belongs to which group? Right, absolutely right. Remember that Abakavir is your first group that is the NRTI. Okay, it belongs to NRTI. All right, and what is the side effect with protease inhibitors? Protease inhibitors basically lead to lipodystrophy. Okay, lipodystrophy is a common side effect with protease inhibitors. Okay, with protease inhibitors. So, remember this is about Abakavir, that is HLA-B testing needs to be done for Abakavir. Going to the next question here, interesting one, a lot of concept testing. Read the question and tell me what do you think is the answer to this.
Okay, I see mixed answers here. Let's see. Okay, I see mixed answers, mixed answers here basically. So the question is saying that uh, atherosclerotic lesions of the coronary arteries can limit the blood flow to the myocardial regions supplied by the affected vessel. Absolutely true that if there is an atherosclerotic lesion, it will affect the blood supply to the affected region. Certain medications can cause a redistribution of blood flow away from the ischemic areas which exacerbates the existing myocardial ischemia. What is this phenomenon basically called as? This phenomenon is basically coronary steel phenomenon. Okay, that's the steel phenomenon. So, from the ischemic area, the blood supply is stolen and it goes to the normal myocardium. So, which of the following drug effects is most likely to produce this phenomenon? So, let's understand this concept of coronary steel and when do we see coronary steel? Now, what happens is when there is this atherosclerosis, okay, when there is atherosclerosis basically and what are we seeing here is, what are we seeing here is the blood flow is basically restricted. This is the normal myocardium receiving the normal blood supply. This is the ischemic myocardium. So, at rest, look at the image. Which one is having the more blood supply or basically it is dilated vessels? Compare the normal myocardium ka blood vessel, the arterioles and the ischemic myocardium ka arterioles. Which ones are dilated at rest? You can see the size is larger. Basically, for the ischemic arterioles, they are dilated at rest. Why? Because basically, ischemic myocardium is getting less blood supply. So, to increase the blood supply to its area, that myocardium releases the local substances. Okay, it releases the local substances like nitric oxide, adenosine, vagera, which will cause the arteriolar dilatation. So, at rest, you will see that the ischemic myocardium the arterioles are dilated. They are maximally dilated to compensate for the limiting blood flow because you can see there is atherosclerosis here as well. Now, if you give a drug which causes arteriolar dilatation, everywhere it causes arteriolar dilatation. So, what will happen? This normal myocardium ka arteriole will get dilated. The ischemic myocardium was always like at rest also, it was maximally dilated. It cannot dilate beyond that. So, what happens in that case that because this is dilated, the normal becomes dilated, the resistance decreases, the blood flow to the normal myocardium increases and the blood flow to the ischemic myocardium decreases because the arterioles cannot dilate further. So, the flow is stolen, right? At rest, the ischemic myocardium has maximal dilatation. This is what we need to understand. So, when you give an arteriolar dilator, the normal also will dilate. So, all the blood supply will go to the normal from the ischemic. So, there is basically the coronary steel which is happening. So, what is causing this coronary steel is basically the arteriolar dilatation of the normal myocardium. Is this clear with everyone? So, basically coronary steel is seen when you have ischemic myocardium, you have normal myocardium and you give an arteriolar dilator. This was already dilated. This gets dilated now the normal one. So, the flow here increases and the ischemic cuff flow decreases. So, that is coronary steel. So, this is because of the arteriolar dilatation, not because of the large artery dilatation, the epicardial. So, basically it is because of the coronary arteriolar dilatation. It is not the epicardial vessel dilatation. Because epicardial vessels are generally your large vessels, like the circumflex vagera. Agar unka dilatation hua, so overall the heart is getting increased blood supply. The redistribution is because of the arteriolar dilatation, right? Decreased myocardial contractility, negative chronotropic effect, systemic venous dilatation. All of this, when there is systemic venous dilatation, what changes? The preload or the afterload, does it decrease or does it increase when there is systemic venous dilatation? Is the preload changes or the afterload changes? 
So venous dilatation basically means now the blood will remain in the veins. So the preload going to the heart will decrease. So that is the decrease preload. So that means basically it decreases the cardiac work. Okay, it decreases the cardiac work. Decrease myocardial contractility again is decreasing the work for the heart. Negative chronotropic effect decreasing the heart rate decreases the work for the heart. So basically options B, D and E, they are decreasing the work for the heart. So they will help, you know, giving rest to the ischemic myocardium. Okay, they will help in uh, giving rest to the ischemic myocardium. So these will not be the answer. Okay. <clears throat> so the answer here is basically coronary arteriolar dilatation. Right. So that's the reason that when we do this... Uh, uh, nuclear scans for identifying the ischemic areas we give this pharmacologic uh, stress testing is also done right we have the pharmacologic stress testing where we can use uh, adenosine we use dipyridamol which basically cause this coronary steel phenomenon okay this coronary steel phenomenon so what do we see with coronary steel this pharmacologic stress testing is the ischemic myocardium will not have the increase in the blood flow. The normal myocardium will have the increase in the blood flow, right? So there will be difference between the two. That is how this pharmacologic stress testing using dipyridamol helps in identifying the ischemic myocardium. Okay, it helps in identifying the ischemic myocardium. Clear with everyone? So this is a coronary steel phenomenon shown by drugs which cause arteriolar dilatation like adenosine and dipyridamol okay let's go to the next question now okay let's go to the next question what do you think will be answer to this one Androgens synthesized in the ovaries are converted to estradiol in which of the following cell types? Absolutely right. That is the granulosa cells. Okay, that is the granulosa cells. They basically convert androgens to estrogen. So important to know this, you know, how the cells in the ovary are acting. Where are the androgens synthesized? Where are these androgens synthesized? Is it the theca interna, theca externa, oocyte or the Leydig cell? The androgens are synthesized in the theca interna. Okay, they are synthesized in the theca interna. Androgens including even progesterone. So basically both of these are synthesized from cholesterol. Okay, this comes from cholesterol. Now this uh, androgens from the theca interna, they go to the granulosa cells to convert. Okay. To convert these androgens to estrogen. To convert these androgens to estrogen. What enzyme is required here to convert androgens to estrogens? What enzyme is required here? It is aromatase. Okay, it is aromatase which is required. Right, remember so you have the drugs which are aromatase inhibitors. So what will be the effect of this aromatase inhibitors? They will prevent the conversion of androgens to estrogens. So basically they will decrease the estrogen levels. Okay, they will decrease the estrogen levels. So if you have like breast cancer, vagera, which is estrogen dependent, you don't want the effects of estrogen, then you give aromatase inhibitor. Like what is the example of aromatase inhibitor? Tell me an example of a drug which is aromatase inhibitor. Yes, which, which drug is an example of aromatase inhibitor? Very good. It is, it is letrozole. Okay, it is letrozole which is aromatase inhibitor. Letrozole. Uh, do we use letrozole also in patients of infertility? 
Is it used in patients of infertility also? Yes. What is the role of letrozole in infertility? So basically by decreasing the estrogen, by decreasing the estrogen, it is increasing the FSH. Okay, it is increasing the FSH ka levels. So follicle stimulating is getting, so there is basically, you know, hyperovulation, follicular stimulation is what we are trying to achieve with letrozole. Okay, that is what is the role of letrozole in infertility. Okay, so remember that basically this aromatase is present in the granulosa cells. Let's have a look at this, how this works basically is, in the theca interna, there is synthesis of androgens from cholesterol and also progesterone. Then these androgens go to the granulosa cells which contain aromatase and convert it to estrogen. So basically this one, the theca interna, this is regulated by LH. The synthesis of androgens is basically by LH. FSH is basically your granulosa cells, that is the estrogen wala. Okay, that's the estrogen wala. Theca externa is just the connective tissue. It acts like the supporting framework. It does not synthesize anything. Okay. And the last option, Leydig cells. There are no Leydig cells basically in the ovary. Leydig cells are present in the testis. They are similar to theca interna of the ovary. They synthesize the androgens, that is testosterone right testosterone synthesis is by the Leydig cells in the testis okay so that was about this question remember this important concept theca interna androgens going to granulosa and that forms the estrogens okay that forms the estrogens all right going to the next one Okay, this is the next question here. Please read the question and tell me what do you think is the answer to this one. Very good. Absolutely right. The answer here is renal artery stenosis. Okay, the answer here is renal artery stenosis. Why is this renal artery stenosis? What are the points in favor of this diagnosis? So basically, 62-year-old man, poorly localized intermittent abdominal pain, abdominal pain that is triggered by eating. Whenever you have this history of abdominal pain triggered by eating, you should always think of what? What should we think of? The mesenteric ischemia. Okay, we should think of this mesenteric ischemia. Because what happens after the meals, the intestines require more blood supply to metabolize that food, right? The meals. So the blood supply required, the demand is more. If the supply is less because of atherosclerosis, ischemia due to any cause, that will increase the pain. It's basically like your intestinal angina. So, when the, in the heart, when the blood supply is decreased, it leads to angina. Similarly, in the intestine, blood supply decreases, it is intestinal angina, which will be triggered by eating. The patient has also lost 4.5 kgs weight. He has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, cigarette smoking, which is a risk factor for atherosclerosis. Blood pressure is high and the CT scan is shown. So, what are we seeing here in the CT scan? Right, all of you agree to this that this is the CT. You see the white bones, right? Even though the bone itself looks black, but always look at the cortex. Okay, the cortex is white. So, this is CT scan. So, in the CT scan, look at the right kidney. This is the right side and look at the left one. Okay, that's the left kidney there. There's a difference in the size of the two. This is small and this is large. So, basically, this is renal artery stenosis where you see the discrepancy in the size. 
So why renal artery stenosis? Because we are thinking of atherosclerosis. History of cigarette smoking, mesenteric ischemia, elderly patient, hyperlipidemia, atherosclerosis involving the renal artery also and leading to renal artery stenosis. And we know that whenever there is renal artery stenosis, there will be the activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system as well. So that will lead to hypertension. So that is called as renovascular hypertension. Okay, that is known as renovascular hypertension. Right. And because of the decreased blood supply, you will see that the kidney gets small in size and the contralateral kidney gets uh, compensates and it increases in size. So it is renal artery stenosis. Right. What is the first investigation that we do if we are suspecting renal artery stenosis? Basically, we do Doppler. Okay. Doppler is done. And what do we look for in Doppler? The parvus tardis waveform. That is a slow rising broad waveform is what we look for in the renal artery stenosis okay and the other one if the investigation of choice is mr angio okay mr angio is good to visualize the renal arteries okay so remember this is renal artery stenosis what drug is contraindicated in bilateral renal artery stenosis it is ace inhibitors ace inhibitors because they do not allow the activation of the RAS system, right? They do not allow this RAS system to do the compensation for the renal artery stenosis. So the blood pressure will significantly go down. The renal perfusion will significantly go down. It can lead to renal failure as well. Okay. So why is the patient asked to fast before renal Doppler? Basically, to avoid the bowel gases as well, but so that it does not interfere with the visualization of, it does not interfere with the visualization of the renal arteries. Renal Doppler is not an uh, easy investigation to be done. Uh, it takes a lot of time and it takes, it needs a lot of patience as well. Okay, so that is, uh, that was about the first five questions for today. So quickly revising what were the five points that we have learned today. First was the MCAD deficiency that will have hypoketotic hypoglycemia in a child if the child is fasting. Second HLA-B57 is basically abacavir. Okay, it is abacavir ABAB. Third is coronary steel is because of Right, the coronary steel is because of arteriolar dilatation, not the epicardial dilatation. And then we have the estradiol is synthesized in the granulosa cells, which basically has aromatase enzyme. Androgens are converted to estrogen in the granulosa. And then the final one, renal artery stenosis, where one kidney is smaller, the other is larger, and there is history of mesenteric ischemia, elderly patient, hyperlipidemia. That is renal artery stenosis. Okay, that's renal artery stenosis. So that was about the today's fast five. What's the plan for today and the rest of the coming days? So today, 5 p.m., we have the mixed bag PYQs in radiology that we will be discussing in the ongoing INICT radiology course. And from tomorrow onwards, right, from tomorrow onwards, 11:30 uh, a.m. we will have the special class that's a free live class and we will have the series of kbmd sessions where we will do mcq discussions like this okay so that was for this session i hope all of you have enjoyed and learned out of it and goodbye take care and keep studying keep revising and keep winning thank you